colleagues today, Iona Huang, who um, noticed on our schedule, the schedule that I um, released to everyone, and she asked about uh, what we would be talking about in the next Python session. And um, I haven't really thought of that. I, I have a few ideas, but I haven't really um, committed myself to anything. But um, Iona made a request. And uh, the request she made was, um, I'll put it in my own words, but uh, what she was interested in is um, when you conduct a survey and sample a population for their opinion on some matter, um, you, you often design the, you know, what sociologists call the, the um, survey instrument, and you design it to learn a little bit about um, specific uh, um, spheres of knowledge. And, you know, we, we might call them um, segments of the, uh, of the survey instrument. And um, often when we do that, we ask questions that, um, that result in categorical data. Um, and uh, it might be that we say, OK, on a scale of one to five, uh, how much do you agree that you maybe you um, completely agree, you somewhat agree, you're neutral or you somewhat disagree or you completely disagree? Maybe all of those are um, our options. And um, we call a scale like that. It's got an order to it. And the, the categories um, themselves are discrete categories. And we, we often might call that a Likert scale, scale um, named after a person who described it, an academic. But another kind of data, and we've talked about how to analyze those data in a few of these sessions over the, over the uh, course of the last uh, year and a half or so. And we've, we've done it in several ways, um, like the structural equation modeling that we talked about. But there is another kind of data you often get from these surveys, and it's a uh, kind of data that are, are free answers. And sometimes you might um, invite a subject to, to make remarks on anything they wish, uh, or maybe you would ask them to elaborate on um, following up on one of their, their categorical Likert scale questions. And in this, um, <clears throat> it's in these free answers that uh, there's a challenge for analysis. And sometimes um, the challenge of this analysis is, um, uh, or a solution to the challenge is called sentiment analysis, where you want to uh, somehow derive from these, this just human written language, the uh, sentiment of the person. And, and maybe it's a sentiment like um, they're satisfied or they're dissatisfied, they're, they're happy or they're angry. They, um, something like that. And um, well, sentiment analysis itself, the analysis of these free text data is a, a big field unto itself. You know, you could you could uh, do a PhD just on the methods for this, but uh, there are some mature methods and uh, there are some mature methods and we have used some in here as well. It's been quite a while ago, but uh, in R we have uh, we have done some of them. But in, in one of um, the, uh, in a couple of Python libraries, there are sentiment analysis tools. And I thought, because Iona mentioned it, that, uh, that we might do that. But um, what I wanna really say here is that uh, if any of you have ideas about some topics for a couple of Python topics, you know, send them to me or, or put them here in chat now and I'll make a note and I'll, uh, I'll want to plan ahead. We're running to the end of the, the boot camp pages of our run on here. I'm just going to copy the, um, the Herrick website, although I don't, don't have the materials up for today. Um, and most of the time that we're going to spend today is on the, uh, the boot camp pages. So I'll just bring up the boot camp, put the link in the um, chat, and specifically we're up to the t-test today and i'll just go ahead and put the the t-test link in there as well now we had talked about um doing tonight's lecture at least uh, me and a few people had talked about doing some alternative ways like uh, maybe we'll we'll skip and just go to the um the um 
exercises. And uh, I, I did begin a lecture, but I've been so busy I haven't finished the, the lecture content. So I thought since it's a short lecture, it has to be short because I didn't finish it. I'll just tonight force myself to quickly go through it and um, we'll stop at the very latest at, um, at 4.30 and we're going to have a full 30 minutes of uh, working with code or working through those exercises live. And um, tonight, because I've been doing an awful lot of talking in here, um, I will invite anybody who wishes, could be anybody, to volunteer to go through the exercises and you share your screen and we can all together come to a solution. Um, so we can try it either way. If there are no volunteers, then uh, then I'll do it, but I'll still do it slowly and uh, we can we can still solve them as a group. OK. So um, <clears throat> tonight the subject is on the T test. This is boot camp 2.5. This is the 10th boot camp. Uh, there are a total of um, of uh, 14 boot camp pages. Um, uh, 11 of them are on basic R programming and basic old fashioned statistics. And this is the 10th out of 11 of those. And the last one it will be next week, analysis of variance, one way ANOVA. The other three, uh, I'm probably um, going to put off and maybe we'll come back to them in a few weeks after a couple of Python weeks after we take a break from the R bootcamp. Um, they're on the subject of uh, open and reproducibility tools like R Markdown or Markdown language to produce like the slides that I usually prepare here. But they can also be used to prepare, um, do typesetting for PDFs. They're much, much, it's much, much better and much, much easier to make um, equations and do technical um, typesetting for reports, whether they're PDFs, whether they're web pages. Um, and it, it's a little bit fun to use them as well. So uh, we also have GitHub um, is one of the other boot camp pages, the use of GitHub and um, um, and I can't remember what the other topic is off the top of my head. So let's go over and just have a look. And uh, best practices is just a generic introduction to best practice for reproducibility. OK, so tonight it's the t-test. And uh, as I said earlier, people have been joining and they may not have heard, but uh, I don't have the lecture up, but I will put it up um, at some point. So here we go. Tonight we're just talking about the t-test. Now this is a humble test. But it's one of the staples. You know, we do it all the time. I, I do it many times every week. And oftentimes, even if I'm going to do a more complicated model, um, just to explore the data um, initially as part of my exploratory data analysis, I very often use these basic simple statistics. Um, and the t-test and the, the statistical test parameter, the, the, the t test statistic that we uh, derive from it, they're one of the most uh, widely used stats tools. We, we teach them almost first, um, and we, we use them almost first, almost all the time. They still do the job after all these years. Now, um, you could say that they're at the, the foundation of statistics, and there's this great story. In case you don't know it, uh, uh, maybe everybody already knows it, but please humor me. I like to tell stories over and over again, ones that I like anyway, that the uh, the t-test was uh, actually invented by William Gossett. And uh, he published it as a paper under the pseudonym student. And uh, he was he was supported in the publication of, of t-test and the t-distribution by R.A. Fisher. Now, why did he publish this under a pseudonym called student. Well, it turns out that uh, William Gossett was a, an employee of the Guinness Brewery. And he was a mathematician that ha had gone to be a, an applied scientist for Guinness. And he was an early practitioner of quality control in, in food science, literally. And uh, the t-test was invented as a tool to compare experiments in quality improvement at Guinness Brewery on Guinness beer. 
And uh, because at the time that he developed it, um, he was using it as part of his work, his, uh, his superiors, his bosses, said uh, to him when they showed it to him, this is fantastic and, and we love it. We love you. We love everything about this. It's so powerful. You know, let's, let's give you a raise and everything. And William Gossett said, I know, right? This is so good. Um, and, and it's so good. I'm going to publish a paper with it. I'm going to give it to the world. It's so powerful. We can't keep it. And the boss has said, hey, wait, no, you can't do that because our competitors will just use it. And then they'll also make good beer. We don't want that. We want you to hide this. We want you to bury it. Now keep it to yourself forever. And so in an act of um, civil disobedience, Gossett published it anyway. They will ne- the bosses at Guinness never in a million years would read Biometrica, the journal. They never in a million years would uh, read a technical paper about a math tool, and he published it anyway under the pseudonym student. I love that story. I love William Gossett. Now, the t-test is a foundational tool for scientists. We use it to compare mean differences. We use it in, um, actually, it's a very flexible tool. I'm going to tell you about three ways that we use it. The commonest way, the way that we're all familiar with, is what we call the two-sample t-test. We're going to compare two means. Technically, what we're doing here is when we collect two samples like that, now it may be an experiment where there's a control and one treatment, something like that. We don't care about the samples. We actually don't care about the mean difference in our samples. This is one of the inaccurate misconceptions or inarticulate way that uh, this test is sometimes portrayed. We don't really care about the difference in the means. What we're actually using the test to compare is whether or not it's likely that the, the population means from which the samples are drawn are different. That's an accurate way to say it. And when we when we are comparing two different populations, we refer to it as a two sample t test. The samples are independent of one another here, and we want to compare the means of those populations. A second way we can use it that's not as common is called a one sample t test. Here, we have a population that we have sampled from, might be experimental, might be observational in the field, and we have a theoretical mean that we have in mind. So we have a known population mean. And here we compare whether or not the population we've drawn our sample from, and we have our sample mean, is different from the expectation of that theoretical mean. That's a one sample t-test, one sample t-test. The last one is when we take um, samples that are not independent of one another, And uh, usually we're talking about exactly two samples. An example, I'll give you a couple of examples. One example might be when you're testing the efficacy of a drug and you measure, um, say, hormone level before and after the administration of a drug. So uh, you'd measure one individual one time before the drug, one individual a second time after the administration of the drug. And because you've measured the same individual, those samples are are paired. Um, And they're not independent of one another. So when there's this, uh, usually it's a a two sample paired t-test where we've measured something that's not independent exactly two times, but there are some other variations I won't go into. Let me give you another example. What if you're doing a um, an experiment? Maybe it's a field experiment, and you're asking um, in a in a field setting. Let's say an agricultural field. You're measuring something about yield or something like that, and um, <clears throat> you've got um, you've got uh, your field divided into two areas, and right down the middle, you have um, you have a dividing line between the two treatments. And uh, let's say that you take a sample in each of the uh, treatment areas in a spatial array like like what I've just drawn. So uh, each pair of samples are are close together to each other in space, and you collect another uh, pair of samples across that dividing line. 
Now uh, here, the non-independence of those samples is a bit different than uh, within the same individual. Here, there may be some, um, some differences across an environmental gradient in that field like soil type or drainage or aspect or uh, how many stones are in the field or any other aspect of it that you haven't measured. And actually, it doesn't even matter whether or not they have an impact in your experiment. We might treat a spatial paired data exper uh, um, sample collection like that. So the samples are non-independent because they are close to each other in time or space, use of space in this case. So that is called a paired sample, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. I guess the last thing that I'd say, I'll go back to this slide for just a second. The last thing I meant to say was that uh, there's actually a, a different mathematics and a slightly different variant of the test uh, underlying each of those variants. So we can't just throw the t test, the generic t test at those three different scenarios. They are actually different mathematics, different tests. Um, and we, we control them in R uh, with the same function, the t.test function. Now, uh, what the whole page goes through is it goes through the, um, the so-called uh, question of the t-test. I'm just going to close this because it keeps pinging. I, I, I just cannot keep up with my emails. I, I get, um, I've been getting 100 a day, <laughs> and, that's include, and that's not including ones that go to the spam folder. So now I'm home and doing this, and I'm turning it off. Okay, the question of the t-test is uh, what, we, what we've just talked about, but we'll revisit it briefly. The data and the assumptions that are required. We'll talk about um, testing the assumptions. I'll demonstrate several ways of graphing the assumptions. Um, I don't believe that I um, have gotten in the slides to the tests and alternatives. So when we get there, um, we'll decide when we switch over to do some coding and, and maybe we'll demonstrate some of the uh, ways to, to make the code for the tests. And We'll, of course, tackle the practice exercises today. Now, the question of the t-test. Remember, we have the three different variants. We have three different versions of the sample. And at the same time as I show you these, I'll show you the traditional way to graph them. So for the two sample t-test, the main question is, did these two samples come from populations with different means? Let me show you a few highlights about the way that I've graphed this. I know that it's popular in some fields to graph continuous data on the y-axis here. Now, this is something that we've measured um, that we're calculating the mean value of for our samples, extrapolating to the population means. And then uh, with the two sample t-test, we have a uh, categorical variable, a factor, with usually exactly two levels. Here, it's uh, we're measuring the the height of of something, possibly the um, the height of uh, of an animal. And uh, when we've sampled those from a population with high density, we can see that the height tends to be low. When we've sampled them from a population at low density the height tends to be higher. Now I've made a uh, box plot for this. Remember my story about George Box. I'll spare you from telling you the George Box story tonight, but the uh, the meaning of the, the symbols in the box plot are that the dark black line is the median, the central value. If, if we have a perfect Gaussian distribution, the mean will be very close to that median value. The edges of the box, the background is in gray, and these boxes are um, rather, rather small in height, is the middle 50% of your data, the interquartile distance between the first and the third quartile. And the whiskers, the so-called whiskers of the, um, the box plot are the 95% confidence interval. Okay, or if there are outliers, it's the range. So there are um, there are no outliers for these data. So these these are the 95% confidence interval. Now superimposed over the box plot, I've I've drawn the um, 
the raw data with a, a little bit of jitter, uh, as we call it in R, to, to move on the x-axis randomly the, the data points. And we do that just so that we can see them when they might overlap. So uh, th these are two independent samples. We would we would use a box plot. I think it's it's um, the best practice to also draw on your raw data points. A lot of times I get resistance to that, and the biggest reason for that resistance is that uh, people are embarrassed of their data. Uh, I say that I, I want to be a little funny when I say it, but I'm I'm not joking whatsoever. The only reason not to put your raw data on these graphs is because you're a little ashamed of the data you've collected. Uh, maybe you're ashamed that someone could could judge the analysis you've done if they could just see the, the actual data. And it, it's a bit deceitful to hide it for that reason, obviously. So it requires a little bravery to show your data. We should all, we should all endeavor to do that. Um, another thing that you've heard me complain about, and maybe I've even, uh, when you're working with me with some data that you've collected, that I've advised against, and sometimes I'm successful at advising against it, is to is to graph data like these with bar plots, where the mean is the height of the bar plot. Now, some fields of study, some fields in science, would traditionally do that. One of the fields is um, agricultural entomology. Every every journal article has, uh, or I would say, 60% of journal journal articles have have bar plots. They're the ones with the oldest principal investigator. It's a very old fashioned way of doing it. The reason it's bad form is that a bar plot is designed to show um, area. Humans are very good at judging different heights of bar plots based on area. So it is very easy to see differences in means. What it obfuscates, what it hides with a bar plot is it hides the, the central tendency of your data. It hides at least the bottom part of the data because literally it, there's a bar the whole way down. And I, and I have never, literally never seen a bar plot made with the actual data superimposed over it. So it's it's bad form. It's considered poor practice. <clears throat> now, one sample t-test, the main question here is, did the one sample you've taken come from a population with a known mean? And is the mean of the population you've sampled from the same as that one known population? Here's, a, here's the way to graph it, the traditional best practice way. Box plot, raw data, and here you would indicate the known population mean. This is a powerful way to do it. We could look at this. You ought to be able to look at a good graph for data that you analyze, and you ought to be able to form an expectation, not only of what statistical test was performed, but what the result of the statistical test is. The best, the best designed graphs are, are like that. This is the uh, classic best practice design for a one sample t-test. So the mean, the blue line is the mean, and the uh, box plot is just as before for our one sample. Last is the, um, is the paired t-test and this this way of plotting the pair t-test is totally different we don't use box plots so this is a paired sample t-test and uh, here the question is fundamentally different here the question we ask is 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 there a consistent difference between paired sample observations what i've done here is I've drawn a what in R we would call a strip chart, <clears throat> and it's it is a design of drawing data that are exactly like data you would use for a box plot. So there is um, a numeric continuous variable on the y-axis, and there are categorical variables on the um, x-axis here with exactly two levels of the factor. This is a uh, yeah, I, I can't remember if this is real data or if I've just made it up, um, to be honest, but uh, it's the amount of nitrogen in soil, and it's um, with, um, with a biochar treatment where we've measured nitrogen before the treatment and then at some time after, and each of the dots that are connected by a line 
represents um, one sampling point. And, and if they're connected by the line, both of the points are the same point in space. And the, the difference between them is the time between the measurements being subsequently taken. We draw a line to connect the dots to indicate that they're paired samples. So that we draw exactly the same kind of graph for the, if it was a medical patient before and after drug treatment or any other example where there is non-independence of paired points. Um, what we're looking for visually in this graph, this is quite a tidy, this is quite a tidy sample of data. Um, <clears throat> and here uh, we're looking for whether or not the, uh, the lines on average have a slope or whether on average they all tend to be rather flat. And in in looking at this, one of the uh, one of the things in addition to the slope of the line that we're looking for is whether or not all the lines are going in the same direction, or whether or not they're they're going in all kinds of crazy directions. And a thing that we can visually see quite clearly on this graph is that even though the means of all of these dots, you might imagine the mean of the left hand um, before treatment is somewhere here in the middle, maybe around 22, let's say. And over here in the after treatment, maybe it's 23. The mean difference of these plots is not very big, you know, we, of the, all those measurements. What we can clearly see, though, on this kind of graph for a paired t-test is that almost all of the lines go up. And uh, that's the power of, of the paired t-test, and that's the power of this kind of graph. Visually, even though the effect size is fairly small, there's a lot of variant variation between the sites. Every single one goes up, or just about every one. And that's what we use this graph for. This kind of plot has a name as well. I'll just say this in passing before I go on. This kind of plot, uh, this is a, a kind of plot I may have made with some of you, or I will make with some of you um, if you come to see me. It's an interaction plot. Um, usually we make an, an interaction plot with a generalized linear model for a more complex design, but it's a very simple interaction plot. And it's an interaction plot because um, it, it, um, it explicitly shows pairs of observations and a bigger uh, interaction plot, a full interaction plot for a full experiment we could show more than just a pair. We could show a whole series. And here, each series is a different individual or a different point uh, where we've taken a sample. So it, it has a name. It's an interaction plot. Now, for the classic t-test, we have some formal assumptions. OK, we went over them. We've been going, been going over them for the last few um, bootcamp pages. The ones for the t-test are these. It's that there are Gaussian residuals. So the deviation from the mean uh, is the residual. Um, but here, it's the, Gaussian it's the Gaussian distribution of residuals for each sample independently. I'll, I'll show you in a minute while the, why this, this little caveat of looking at the residual um, um, distribution is, is important to think of separately for the two uh, samples. Second, we assume heteroscedasticity, uh, or we assume, we assume, uh, we examine for heteroscedasticity, which is differing variance between our samples. What, what we assume actually is homoscedasticity, that there's not any difference in the variance. Now, this is an interesting one for the T t-test, uh, even though formally for the original t-test, we make the assumption of heteroscedasticity, um, and, and that this applies for the two sample tests, where we have two independent samples, and it also uh, applies for the uh, paired sample test. But uh, let's put a pin in that. I'll come back to that uh, assumption of homoscedasticity in just a moment. And last, we assume the um, that there's an independence of observations. This applies to all three tests, 
for the two sample t-tests, it implies that um, every single um, observation in each um, in each sample is independent from all the others in the sample and all the others in the other sample too. For the one sample t-test, where we have the population mean in our sample, we, the, assemble, the assumption of independence is that every observation in our sample is independent from every other observation. And for the, um, for the paired t-test, we assume that uh, with the exception of the single points in each sample that are paired explicitly, that every pair of, uh, of points constituting each sample are independent of one another. So that's how the independence of observations comes in. Now, um, you know, the informal assumptions are, are the, those, those are the formal assumptions for, from a theoretical perspective. And, and I, what I refer to here is the informal assumptions. They're the ones we actually test. The, they're the ones we actually have to take responsibility for. Now, um, we do have responsibility to examine whether our data are Gaussian within each sample. Now, um, the, the heteroscedasticity, now in practice, the default in most statistics packages, it, it's very common if you collect two samples that the, uh, the actual measure of, um, of uh, the standard deviation or, or the variance is uh, is a little bit different. And if you have a small sample size, they're likely to be quite different, you know, because of sampling error. In practice, we have a little little get out of jail card for this with the t-test and that there's a method that um, accounts for differences in the variance by performing a calculation that pools the estimate of standard deviation, weighting the difference according to, uh, or weighting the, the the pooled value of the standard deviation by the individual samples. And, and it can weight it by sample size as well. And lucky for us, it's the default in R to calculate the pooled standard deviation unless we tell it otherwise. And it is like that in most software. So this tool has been around for a while. So in practice, even though we formally make this assumption, informally we, we ignore it. Now the independence of observations is a, an important one. This is this has to do with sampling. It doesn't have to do with analysis at all. So we we have to design our samples to be independent and pick the appropriate test to follow on with it. And in practice, there's there's not a mathematical way to test that assumption. So really, it's it's the Gaussian assumption that we um, we have to worry about. <clears throat> Now, um, I already see that I've, I've already overshot my time. So uh, what I wanted to show you here, I'm going to go quite fast the last couple of slides, is that uh, it doesn't make any sense to test all of the data for Gaussian, but uh, this is a very common error that I see. Because let's say we had, an, um, we had a uh, distribution of height for females and for males. Well, we know that they're not going to be Gaussian. This is, would be a bimodal distribution. So I've just diagrammed that here. And uh, I just want to show a little example about the assumptions, about how I would go about testing them as part of exploratory data analysis. I'm using the iris data. Remember that has got four different numeric measures of, um, of plant flowers. And then it's got species. There are actually three species in the iris data set. So what I've done is I've just yoinked out just two of the species. I know the first 100 rows are um, are just exactly two species, Setosa and Versicolor, in this classic data set. <clears throat> 150 total observations. So I've just pulled out one of the measures, uh, the species and, and the first numeric measure. Because I've pulled out just two levels of a variable that had three factors, I've used the um, fat function drop levels to get rid of that that other level. And then I've made a box plot and I've, I've um, made the box plot of um, sepal length on the y-axis as a function of species on the x-axis. 
the classic way. And I've overlaid that with a strip chart that uh, does exactly the same thing. Now I have to add a fair few arguments. I put the model formula, I put the data. Here I like, as you know, you know I like a little bit of um, vanity coloration on my graphs. I've set the um, symbol to number my favorite, number 16, a solid dot, a small solid dot, color to red. I've set the strip chart, the classic strip chart is inverted where the um, categories are on the Y axis. So they would go like that. So I've, I've put this one to be a vertical one where the, um, the differences are on the X axis. I've set it to add true to overlay it on my box plot. And I've put the method to jitter so we get the jitter. So this is a, a nice way to do it. What we're looking for is whether or not these um, observations centered on this box plot are Gaussian or not. It's hard to do that. Can turn your head sideways and it's still hard to do it. So the wrong way to do it would be just to uh, graph everything. That looks like a, a lumpy mess. It's two species, one measure. Here it's sepal length on the x-axis and the frequency of observations on the y. Here I've uh, set the parameters for graphing output to um, stack, to have two rows and one column. And I've just drawn two histograms first for Satoza, the first 50 rows, and second for Versicolor, the second 50 rows. Okay, there are various ways I could do this. This looks a little bit more Gaussian to me, and this looks a little bit skewed. I, I really, I wouldn't probably typically stack them just to explore the data, but um, it's easy to see like this as an example. I think that's as far as I got with the, um, with the slides this week. And I'll, I will finish those and, and put them up afterwards. What I'd like to do now is um, go back to the old um, boot camp page. And in our last minutes together, work on uh, these these questions down here. Now we could read the questions on the page, but um, Let's see if I have got a uh, convenient. <clears throat> a convenient script that we could have a look at. And let's just see if I have. Um, <clears throat> and I have. And at some point in the script, um, I had some data, so let's just make sure that I've got the. Um, the data set in here. We can go back to the um, page and uh, it looks like for 2.5 I've got um, this data set. So I'm just going to download that. Save link as. I've made a little place on my computer for that. And I'm saving 2.5 Davis. There we go. <clears throat> and uh, now we have a choice. How do we want to use our last 20 minutes? Would you like, um, would, is there a volunteer in the audience who would like to share their screen? And uh, I can share over the, um, well, we don't need to share anything. We could just do this from uh, from code from our studio and we could as a group watch someone else code if someone would like to volunteer. Is there anyone? And if there's if there are no quick volunteers leaping to the front of the line, thrusting forward to to try to do this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hello, you want to do it, George? Um, I would ask them, but my signal is extremely bad. You keep breaking in and out. I'm happy to share my screen. I'm, uh, if, if you guys want to talk me through what, what we're going to do. Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Yeah, that'd be good. I'll unshare and share away. Thank you for that.
<clears throat> okay. Do you have um do you have the questions in place down at the bottom? Maybe we could just make a new section at the bottom. And um, would it help you if uh, if I um, copied and pasted the questions into the chat for you, or can, or do you have the web page up? I, I'm trying to do that, Ed. Copy them in the chat, but it's not my my internet page isn't loading to get them up. I can copy and paste the, the, the questions in the in the chat. Yeah, okay, it's okay. Looks like um Oh yeah, no, no, looks no. like Matt's got it. I did copy and paste them in there too. Let's see if they actually come up. Okay, cool. We got it. Go into the code and gonna comment them out. It's cool. under the code drop down. It's up a little bit, the comment, uncomment. There you go. Cool. All right. Now, um, the very first thing to do with this set of practice exercises is if you look on the web page, right at the beginning of the, um, the section, there's a link to a data set right up at the top called 2.5-davis.xl. It's right at the top of the questions section, I'm sorry. There it is. So if you download that to a convenient place and then maybe open it up and let's have a peek at it first. <clears throat> Great. Maybe let's just open it in an Excel first and um, just have a peek at it because it makes mention of a data dictionary. It should be in tidy data format. It's like we have sex, weight, height. <clears throat> and something called rep weight and rep height. Let's look at the dictionary and see what those are. Okay, so that's um, got some subjects, got the self-reported sex, got the uh, weight measured in kilograms and height in centimeters that, that has been measured by the scientist. Then we've got reported weight and reported height. There's a comment and it says a sample of university students were asked to self-report weight and height, and then they were measured. Okay. And the source is from a built-in data set. So um, <clears throat> here's question one. Question one is um, pick the appropriate form of the t-test to ask whether male reported and actual height are the same. Uh, perform the test, make a graph to illustrate, and report your results in the technical style. So first question, what kind of t-test would be appropriate for um, comparing male measured weight versus male reported weight? Wouldn't it be the second one uh, you described, the one that you compare with the population uh, mean? A one that you have already determined. Um, now you you could actually do that with this data set. You you could actually do that. 
Uh, we've got the three choices, right? We've got a two sample t test. We've got um, the one sample t test. We could actually do that because we have the real. In this case, we have measured the real actual weight, and we could we could ask overall whether the reported weight is the same as the different one. Would the paired t test work at all? Go on, Katia. Yeah, I think paired t test. Paired t test. Yep. So. So we would pair it by the ID of the male. Yeah, because because we've got two measures for each male, each subject. So I think that one is probably. Probably a, an interesting one to do, too. OK, so. Um, <clears throat> so a paired T test, so it says uh, pick the appropriate form of T test. Let's pick paired. Uh, we could do a one sample t test, but for the sake of this, let's do paired and perform the test. Now, what uh, what is the t test uh, function? T dot test. T dot test. T dot test. Okay, and then we'll just have to figure out how to use t.test to perform a paired t-test. So how do we learn easiest way to learn how to use a function? Help. Bring up the help every time. The one way you could run it with that code is to highlight the question mark and the t.test part, but not the brackets. There you go. And control enter with your cursor on the line. There we go. OK. So uh, if we look down there, can we find something that um, that would work? Do we see something under the usage column? An argument that might control? I see an argument. Does anyone see an argument? There we go. If anyone sees it, yell it out. There you go. The paired argument. OK. So for the t-test, uh, the first thing we're going to need to do is read in the data. <clears throat> it's in an Excel file, so you're going to need to set your working directory. The what you are in the right place. The, yeah, you could do it that way, sure. So does anyone want to um, talk through reading in the data file that's in an Excel spreadsheet? Yes, so you need to open up your library first, so library Excel SX. Oh, sorry, open Excel SX. Then run that and hope that it's already installed. So yeah, it is. Um, then we're going to do name the data, so data. So data and then crocodiles dash.
I was wondering then, what you meant by crocodiles, but now I understand. <laughs> Sorry. Um, then read XLSX, because it's an Excel file, not a CSV. Then the location of the file. <clears throat> Might have to set the working directory, actually prior to this, sorry, I forgot about that. So the name of the file in commas, in apostrophes. Sorry, I think it may have frozen on my side. You can still see it here. <clears throat> oh, that's good. Sorry, I'm tethering from my phone at the minute. Um, I think, did, did it load the data? So you, your working directory was already set. Fair yep. enough. So yeah, t-test, open bracket, um, the data, then x equals the variable of the actual height and then y equals the variable of the measured height. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know if it's worth having a look at the data because when I downloaded into R, um, I saw that two of the variables are in character, so the test might not work. Oh, let's. Uh, so we need to so, convert them to the The passive aggressor oh, no, has has read them in. He's probably if if they were in character, he's read them in and uh, taken liberties with your data. Good call, though. We do need to pay attention to stuff like that. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. That is looking pretty good to me. <clears throat> okay, so we get our traditional output there. Remember, for every statistical test, we uh, we report three things exactly: the uh, the test statistic, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value. Usually, that's the minimum. So uh, our our means different. Someone would someone volunteer to interpret the uh, results? Yep, go on, Katia. Just yell it out. We're in the last two minutes here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, but um, have we used both male and female in this pair test? Yeah, I was going to say that the, the question says um, male, but I, I guess we can just interpret these ones. <laughs> we're out of we're out of time, but you're exactly right. I was I was hoping there was enough time to explore that, <laughs> but yes, you're exactly right. We've uh, we have used all the data and not just male and female, but but let's interpret the data for for both sexes together since we've uh, since we've done it this way first. 
So is there a difference first? So we see that the p value it's above uh, no, sorry, it's below 0 0.05. So that means there is evidence that there is difference. That's right. There is a difference. Statistically significant difference. It's, now, uh, how different are they? Do we have any information about that down there? Can we figure that out? What would we expect? Would we expect real or reported to be? Since we know they're different, which one is higher? Which one would you expect? Uh, so I think um, the reported one is above the actual by 1.48. That would be my guess too, but I would double check it because it's not indicated. It doesn't actually explicitly say it in the results. Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> so we have the median is uh, exactly 63 for weight and reported weight. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's the median and the mean is uh, 65.8 and 65.62. So that's, uh, oh, that's for weight, but we're talking height here. So the mean is 170 for height, and it's 168.5 for reported height. So people are, um, yeah. people are reporting their height to be a little shorter than they actually are. That's a little weird. Um, well, we're out of time. Uh, now, you guys could stay here. Uh, at least some of you could stay here and continue this, but we have the other meeting for the big stats class, so unfortunately we'll have to go home. I actually, I, even though it, it, we, it took us a while to get going, I really like watching somebody else code. <laughs> so maybe we'll do more of this and spend maybe all the time next week just uh, doing something like this. So may I suggest that everyone has a, has a uh, makes an effort to read the ANOVA page for next time, and we'll just start off with the um, with the um, the exercises next time. So let's do it that way next time. And if you have any trouble getting through the page, bring the questions with the trouble. Attempt the uh, exercises yourself. Thanks, everyone. I have to run, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>